Snap Judgment Studios. Daily Show correspondent Dulce Sloan and writer Josh Johnson are best friends who rarely agree on anything. On the new podcast called Hold Up with Dulce Sloan and Josh Johnson, they turn their hilarious, unpredictable, and legendary office banter into a war of words about topics big and small, mostly small, from texting versus calling to club bangers versus conscious rap and everything in between. Listen to Hold Up with Dulce Sloan and Josh Johnson from The Daily Show every Thursday on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Odoo, it's the most popular open source ERP for many reasons. It's affordable, easy to use. However, most companies rely on Odoo because their applications are fully integrated. But wait, what does fully integrated mean? Imagine the mechanic. They don't waste time running around a shop looking for tools. They keep everything they need in one convenient toolbox. Odoo is just like that. But instead of a hammer or a wrench, you get applications for every aspect of your company. They're always connected and communicating with each other, letting you stay up to date at all times. For a free trial, visit odoo.com slash snap. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash snap. So many times, the first casualty of loss is truth. Instead of a clear-eyed reflection at what happened, we avoid talking about the thing. Head in the sand, full speed ahead, don't look back, or even worse, people, well-meaning people will revert to platitudes. Thoughts and prayers. You will never receive more than you can handle, or they might even tell you that time heals all wounds. And I think that's why I love today's story so very much. Why it's so beautiful, because it finally tells the truth about one of the hardest subjects ever. And even still, this is not a story about suicide. This is a story about a boy. A boy called Finn who loved to fish and play baseball and write poetry and embroider. It's a story about what happens to a small Vermont community as it staggers forward after unspeakable tragedy. And I love the people who open themselves to share their truth. It's a true gift to all of us. And I know when you hear it, you're gonna love them too. From our friends at the Rumble Strip Podcast today on Snap Judgment, we proudly present Finn and the Bell. He'd write little notes to find in weird places. You know, he'd write notes on on logs. So when we would, you know, in the winter, deep in the winter, go out to get wood for the fire, there'd be like a, hi, mama, I love you. I found one of them this summer. I, I was afraid I was going to, but also really wanted to. I couldn't decide which way I wanted to go with that. <laughs> he just recognized coziness and was always trying to to create that. What, you know, the blanket felt like was important or like, let's get our pajamas on, you know, and, and let's you know, we make cookies. He just recognized the importance of little things you could do to make day-to-day life so much exponentially better. And he um, was determined to, to do that all the time. He appreciated leaving the light on all night so there would be a bunch of moths in the morning. Or he appreciated a perennial garden and it would say like, look at their perennial garden. <laughs> You know, or or a compost pile, a, a perfect song being played at, at the perfect time. What did he look like? He um, he wasn't very tall. He was five seven, or he had long. He um, when he was little, he had really long hair, like down close to you know his hip bones, probably. And then um, as a teenager, he would let it grow. 
you know, down past his shoulders, cut it, let it grow long again. Um, but then um, about a month before he died, he had, he cut it. That's something I think about a lot. Yeah. That's Tara, Finn's mother. Finn Rooney killed himself on January 3rd, 2020, in the afternoon after school. This story will not explain why he did this, as if anyone can explain why a person takes his own life. Suffice to say that not a single person in his life predicted this. There were no signs. The closest one can say is that there was a flash of high emotion that comes with youth, and there was a gun nearby, and bullets. This is not a story about suicide. It's a story about a boy called Finn Rooney who lived in Walden, Vermont, near Hardwick, with his mother Tara and brother Lyle, and occasionally his father Alex, who is a long-haul truck driver. A boy who loved to fish and play baseball. He played the euphonium not very well. He was the student body president, and right before he died, he had an idea about a bell. This is Finn's friend Alex talking about the town of Hardwick. Well, Hardwick's more like a, you know, just they got pretty much everything to a certain extent. There's a couple grocery stores, but they ain't big by any means. There's a Walgreens. There's a couple banks, two hardware stores, gun shop, a car de- a Ford dealership. So there's not a whole lot, but it's definitely more than what Greensboro has. And what is the what are the people like in Hardwick different from Greensboro? Well, Greensboro, they're more, I've come across from working at Willie's over here in Greensboro, that Gre- the Greensboro folk are a little more high class, I guess you can call it. They have a little more, their pockets are a little deeper. They're a little more liberal, I guess you could say, but then Hardwick, you know, just a bunch of hicks, a good chair of them. Hardwick's kind of like, it's the perfect combination of hippies and rednecks hippie, redneck combination type of thing. This is Finn's friend, Allie. For lack of a better word, like a cesspool of, like, hipnecks. <laughs> what was Finn? Finn was a total hipneck. He was the most ideal combination of a hipneck you can get. He wasn't... Because sometimes there's some that are, like, 70-30% hippie redneck. Finn was 50-50. He was right in the middle. If you needed him to help you weed your garden, he'd do it. If you needed him to help fix your truck, he'd do it. It was just, he was very much in the middle, could do anything you asked him to do. He partook in activities of every single crowd around. This is Mac. He was the star baseball player. He was the student council president. He was, he liked to go and fish and hunt and work on his truck. He did everything. And he, that's why he was friends with everybody. Again, here's Finn's mom, Tara. You know, there's it's a farming community, a logging community. Um, people have lived here for six generations. There's like last names that are last names, you know. And um, Finn was like, how long would it take for Rooney to be like a Hardwick last name, you know? And people were like, 200 years maybe <laughs> you know and, and so we were like we've got a work cut out for us so he was he was active in bread and puppet a theater group in glover as a really little kid when we first moved here in 2010 he really wanted to do that so he joined the band kind of or he would like play in parades and stuff that first year we came but he was also looking for um establishing himself in hardwick and that was that's a different trajectory. <laughs> and so he um, joined the volunteer fire department. He was a junior firefighter when he was, I guess that would be the first year we moved here. Butch, our neighbor, was the assistant fire chief and had been in the fire department for 50 years or something and, and offered Finn to go. We had a pager. The pager would go off the middle, middle of the night and, and Finn would go get his gear on real fast and go out in Butch's truck and Butch would take him to these fires. And he was very interested in everything. This is Butch. He paid attention to every last thing that was going on and he wanted to learn everything that was going on. When you're out of fire, he was right there 
want to see how everything was done and why it was done. And, and that, that was him. He was just, he was 17, but his mind was, I think, way more than 17. I first met Finn. Uh, we went fishing. This is Aaron. We had our fishing spots. And people always wanted to go with us, but it was usually just a me and him thing. It was really fun going trout fishing with him because he knew the rivers pretty well. That's as much as Aaron wanted to say to me. I asked if instead of talking, he could take me to one of their fishing spots. This is good. So this is one of me and Finn's fishing spots. Where are we? We are at one of me and Finn's fishing spots. You're not going to tell me where this is? No, I won't tell anybody where this spot is. It's me and Finn's spot. This is the sound of the Bread and Puppet Circus. He um, wrote poetry, drove his truck really fast, pissed off the neighbors. I remember he would uh, go out sometimes when I was making dinner and, and, and pick like seed heads, put them in a mason jar and stick it on the table, light candles, you know, without asking. He liked a well-set table. That's it, Finn! Woo! This is Mirko, Finn's baseball coach. Finn had this glove that was given to him. And during the game, it, the strings would break, and we'd restring it, and we'd like try to give him a glove. And he's like, "Coach, this is the glove." And he had these cleats that were duct taped up. There's a new pair of cleats that were given to. We never had metal cleats, and at this level, they can wear metal. And then I see him at practice. He's wearing his old duct tape cleats up, and I'm like, "Finn, you got a new set of cleats, Coach? Those are for games only. We, I wear those for games." So then after every game, he'd take them off and wipe them down and put them back in the box. We brought some teams in New England, and we represented Vermont, and the coaches from the other team would come up to me and say, who's that center field? If I had nine players like that. So even coaches that never coached them could see his work ethic and his love for the game. Lyle and Finn would every day for hours, that was the sound of summer, was like the, the sound of a ball getting into a glove. Come on, Lyle, like, let's go outside and... I find baseballs in the yard, you know, in the field all the time, still. Because before we had the sheep, the grass would just get too big and they'd lose them. The, the ball, that sound... I give just about anything in the world to hear that. Yeah. In just a moment, we're dropped into the heart of a community. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Snap Judgment. Finn and the bell a story about a family's and a community's response to the death by suicide of one of their own it was a Friday evening and I was at home and the phone rang this is Hazen Union High School principal, David Perigo. It was our 
director of guidance telling me that she had some horrible news. And I said, okay. And she said, we have reason to believe that one of our students took their own life this afternoon. And I shook my head and just said, how do we know that? What do you mean we, we have reason to believe? We, and who are we talking about? And when she told me that we were talking about Finn Rooney, I just didn't know what to make of it. And, you know, within a couple hours, we had confirmed that it had happened. And I went to bed that night thinking, I don't know what to do. I, I, I want to go to sleep and I want to wake up and I want this all to be gone. And I went to sleep that night, and when I woke up this morning, I was like, we've just had a terrible thing happen to our community. It's really big, and we got to step into this and figure it out. And finally, that morning, in a conversation with Finn's mom, Tara, we had to have that conversation about how we were going to deal with this in the community. We had to communicate to the larger community that this had happened. But from the very beginning, Tar was very clear. We are not going to back away from the fact that this was a suicide. This was a suicide. And I can't tell you how helpful that was. I mean, that lifted such a burden from our shoulders about trying to pussyfoot around some kind of gentle way of breaking this to people that was going to be half true because everybody in in this community knew exactly what had happened. And I give Finn's family enormous credit. They were generous in their grief. And that was so helpful to the rest of us who were trying to figure out where do we fit here? Where do we, where do we fit in? People just um, rallied around us like a GoFundMe and a a meal train and somewhere for us to stay for a couple of weeks. Boxes of like toilet paper and like tea and bourbon, so much bourbon and like, um, and Lyle plays basketball and I went to the games, which I can't believe now because I was sort of in serious shock still then. And we would sort of walk and there would almost be like a, like a sea parting, but, but not obnoxious. Like I can't, I can't explain it. It was just like reverence almost. That's not the right word. Reverence isn't the right word. It was, it was um, just care. They'd play the national anthem, which is obviously like a big thing for baseball. And I was like a mess, like sobbing every time they play the national anthem. But then whoever I was sitting by would like put their hand on my shoulder. And whether it was like a logger or like a mom or a... People just held us. Tom Gilbert from Black Dirt Farm set up this this bonfire where he burnt rafters from his from his barn, like hundred year old very special rafters, and and hundreds of people from town came, and there were snow machines, and there were farmers on John Deere's singing hippie songs, and it was deep during the primaries, so politics were just really ugly at that time. Faye was so eager for that to be over, just so people could have a bonfire. He used to say, I just wish we could all have a bonfire. And there it was. And it was, it was really beautiful, really uh, transcendent, and uh, really sad. Finn was student body president at Hazen Union High School 
and in the months before he died, he heard a story about a bell, an old bell that used to hang in the belfry at Hardwick Academy in the middle of town before the school was knocked down in 1970 and Hazen Union High School was built right up the hill. He heard that they would ring this bell when Hardwick teams won away games so that the whole valley knew about the win altogether. Finn Rooney loved this idea, which maybe isn't surprising. He was a kid who had some notion of community being something inclusive and participatory, a verb even. He wanted to live in a town where there was a bonfire and everybody came. Finn was not a fan of smartphones or the internet in a lot of ways. So this was a way that people communicated that was different than posting it on Facebook. <laughs> and he really loved that idea. He also thought that it could bring together different f people in Hardwick. The whole election and stuff was really bumming him out. And he thought this was a way of, of um, everybody would be excited to hear the bell. So he ran for student body president and that was sort of his main platform was that he was going to get the bell back to Hazen, and there was, yeah! And actually, everybody was like, what do you... Kids didn't know about the bell. But he explained that there used to be this bell, and that he was going to get the bell back. But that he also didn't want it just to be for sports, that he was going to make it, like, if somebody won a spelling bee, or if somebody was born, that they would ring the bell. We talked about it a lot at dinner. Um, his dad says he remembers Finn being in his truck, and talking about the bell like it, it was just this this thing and so then when he died it quickly there was a lot of talk about getting the bell it sort of took on a life of its own Finn passed away in early January the first week of January and his passing just rocked the community at a level that um, was inexplicable no one would have ever believed that this could have happened to Finn. So when Finn passed, the community was in shock for quite a long time. And this memory of this dream that he had about the Hardwick Academy bell began to resonate with people. It turned out some people in town didn't want to give up the Hardwick bell, but then Dave Perigo got a call. There was another bell lying on the bank outside the Greensboro Town Hall. It was the bell from the old Greensboro School, which also had closed when the schools unionized and Hazen was built. And the people of Greensboro were glad to donate it to Hazen. The fact that he felt strong enough that Hazen's community could use a, a bell that would bring the school together for all of our high points, you know, games and graduations, just to ring out... You know, I think that's that's a, a wonderful thing, and surprisingly, no one had come up with that before. This is Greensboro town clerk Kim Greaves. Uh, everybody was supportive of having our bell taken care of in a way that uh, obviously we had not done. And I mean, it's got a wicked, beautiful tone, and I think it's going to be spectacular. As old as it is, it's an incredible tone. So it's going to, hopefully, you know, I mean, all the the games and the graduations that'll ring forever and it will um, be restored to its glory. My truck's an 83 Chevy K30. Um, it's a single cab long bed. It's a eight inch lift, 40 inch tires. It makes about 500 horse. I've had some transmission problems recently, but let's hope it holds together for today's mission. Finn wanted to bring this bell to Hazen and Finn's family asked if I wanted to haul the bell with my Chevy. I mean, it is a real sharp looking truck, but... Are you nervous? Yeah, I am. I don't know if my truck's gonna hold together. I got the whole town of Hardwick and Greensboro on my shoulders, so I don't need to mess this up by any means, but if I do, if my truck does die, then Finn would have definitely appreciated that. So on a rainy day in the spring, people gathered in the parking lot at the Greensboro Town Hall for the moving of the bell. Baseball players, Butch and the Walden Fire Department, town clerks and farmers and the Bread and Puppet Band, and Alex with his enormous bright red truck. Yeah. 
last well, well, couple of nights. Oh, did you? Yeah. I had a fox come in and kill 11 of mine. Oh, that's what happened to mine. Oh, and the guy killed him? Yeah. Uh, I had seven, then I had five. So thank you yeah. all very, very much for joining us on this very special occasion here today. When we began to launch this bell project, one of the things we thought of was that we might get our own bell. We might have a bell made for us, special. And then when this bell appeared, we realized what a gift. Not a new bell, a young, inexperienced bell. <laughs> but a bell with maturity and spirit, a bell that has rung out to the community of Greensboro throughout its history, and a bell that will become our bell in Hazen. So we are um, incredibly grateful to the town of Greensboro for this. So in our appreciation today, we would like to present this letter to the town of Greensboro. Um, dear Greensboro Select Board and residents of the town of Greensboro, on behalf of our entire union, we would like to extend our deepest thanks to our friends and fellow union members of the town of Greensboro for your gracious gift of the former Greensboro school bell to Hazen and the entire union. The gift has allowed us to advance a dream first articulated by our former student body president, Finn Rooney, to bring a working bell back to Hazen to once again ring out over the hills and the valleys of our community, to inform, to celebrate, to unify, and to heal, a theme that is tremendous part of our beloved <coughs> Finn's legacy. Today we plan to welcome your bell to its new life as our union's bell. Sorry. We commit to caring for it in its new home and respecting its great history as it begins its new life and mission to once again and into perpetuity sound its golden tone across our beloved greater community. If you would like to motivate and inspire this group of people with the revving of your truck, with the, just don't blow the train. <laughs> That'd be cool. That would get people like mobilized and realizing that we're Load about up, to go. Right. All the fire trucks are already down there. And so Alex and Lyle and a few other guys loaded the bell into the back of Alex's 83 Chevy K30 and the whole party, along with the Walden Fire Department and the Bread and Puppet Band, convoyed down to Hazen Union to deliver the bell to its next home, just like Finn wanted. It, it never felt clumsy. It was like so not clumsy in a town that maybe a lot of people consider clumsy and and sort of, you know, Hardwick. I mean, you know, there's all sorts of jokes about Hardwick. It was sort of that idea of Hardwick that was actually the most beautiful, real human experience of my entire life. I'd walk to the, go to my mechanic and he was sobbing and like, can I change your oil? <laughs> or like the diner has a sandwich named after him. The one year anniversary, there were people made snowflakes with his name on them and taped them all around town. The bell. He came home, I was on the couch, and, and normally, as, as soon as either of the boys come in, I would check in with them, you know, look at their face and ask them how their day was, and th they very rarely even got up the steps without us talking for 10 minutes or something about, about their day. Um, but this day, 
was different. And his dad caught him at the door. Um, we didn't, it was winter and we needed wood for the fire. And I said, hey, Finn, can you grab some wood for the fire? And he said, yep. And he t- went back outside and <laughs> grabbed some wood for the, for the wood stove was coming in through the mudroom and his, I said, or his dad said, hey, you want to go out to get something to eat? And Finn said, no, nah, I'm not hungry. And uh, he went upstairs. His dad and his brother and I were all sitting downstairs in the living room next to the, next to the chimney. And the chimney went through Finn's bedroom. So we were probably down there for five minutes the sound (laughs) went right down the chimney and it took a long time to sort of I mean it probably was half a second but in my head it it, I knew then we all started screaming pretty much except Lyle he was just standing there and and uh I let's I'm just gonna go get Butch. Butch will know what to do. He's on the fire squad and and I I went outside, it was snowing, it was beautiful. I I put on whichever boots I could find. They they were mismatched and, and like one was Finn's and one was Lyle's like Boggs. And uh they were both left feet. <laughs> And I, and I, it was like I was watching it all. I can't, I can't explain, but, um, but not what, like, it, it's not that I wasn't present. I, I was like fully present, but also like watching it at the same time. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I, I, I got to their barn. They have this big floodlight on their house. I, I, I got there and it was snowing and, and you know, Sometimes when you look up at a light and it's snowing, it's like so beautiful. And um, I, I, I stopped screaming. I, I'd been screaming this whole way. And I, I, I looked up at that light and it was snowing and um, it, it felt like there was no time like at all. Like, and, and the whole life flashing before your eyes thing, I guess there was a part of that because I could see Finn at all of his ages, all at once, all at once, and and me all at once, and like uh, everybody I'd ever met all at once. <laughs> I mean, it, it sounds so, but like you know, like volcanoes and like <laughs> dinosaurs and um, the Big Bang, uh, seasons like rapidly changing, you know, um, like me getting old uh, without him him being old like I, it kind of was like me Finn and God I'd say that's the best way I've ever described it and I I felt like Finn was like gathering like like all of what was left of him, like the energy that was still like all like everywhere because he was just such a big person. And and I I was like sort of waiting kind of patiently almost for it to all like gather. And then it was like, like it, it, it just sort of got in me somehow is how I felt it I I, I, you know I've explained this like very few times but um it was like infinite compassion for like every single person that had ever lived like including me and, and and including Finn for doing this I remember saying out loud oh Like, I understood for for just a second there, like, why we were alive. And it felt like it was for each other. 
also play this game. I want to thank every single person who talked with me for this show. All of these interviews were important in ways that is hard to describe. I especially want to thank Finn's mother, Tara Reese, whose openness and insights were astonishing and generous. I also want to thank my friends Amelia Meath, Tobin Anderson, Claire Dolan, and Mark Davis, without whom I could not have made this show. And if you like this story, please send it to people who you think might like to hear it too. Thanks a lot for listening. That was Finn and the Bell. Produced by Erica Hellman for her podcast, Rumble Strip. This is a podcast you need to know about. Big thanks to Tara Reese for her insights and for her courage in the making of this show. And thanks to all the people of Hardwick and thanks as well to the Bread and Puppet Band. Now, if you or someone you know needs support, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline telephone number is 800-273-8255. Since this show was made, Erica and Tara and their friend Rose has started an organization in Hardwick called the Civic Standard, whose mission is to give the people of Hardwick plenty of excuses to get together and to make events where everyone is welcome and everyone comes. For more about Finn and the Bell and to read people's reactions to this show, visit rumblestripvermont.com. After the break, we sit down and talk to Finn's mom. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Snap Judgment. My name is Gum Washington, and we just heard the amazing audio story, Finn and the Bell, from the Rumble Strip podcast. And right now, I'm lucky enough to sit down with Finn's mother, Tara, and really just speak to her about opening up. Thank you, Tara, for coming on Snap. I really appreciate it. Every parent that listens to your story, they have to put themselves in your place. And I'm a parent. Imagining that space that you were in and knowing myself, um, I know that my world would get smaller and darker, but you went the other way and you let people in. I guess the way that you dealt with this situation, was that an echo of Finn? Yes. Uh, um, sorry, I'm I'm trying to <laughs> form thoughts. Um, he he was still so present. He was so present with everybody, um, mm. right off the bat, and like everybody wasn't afraid to feel his presence, and it was remarkable. And then everybody sort of knew it was remarkable, and so then it just kept growing, and that felt like Finn. Um, but I mean, it was like everything felt holy. Um, you know, a baseball game afterwards felt, you know, like everybody was just a, l- a little bit closer to, um, to truth. Wow. You said holy. You all set up the bell as a monument to kind of Finn's desires, his wishes. What do you feel 
when you hear that bell ring? It's complicated. I mean, even you know, truthfully, even the bell happening is complicated, was complicated. Um, the bell, I actually rang it yesterday. Really? <laughs> Um, why this 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 well because the the um the the rope is usually wrapped up but the the kid the soccer team must have won a game the night before and they hadn't wrapped it back up and I I teach at the at the school um well I facilitate a class and um the woman um who I facilitate the class with it was the anniversary of her father's death and we were walking outside and the rope was dangling and I said I'm gonna ring that bell <laughs> It was, it was the middle of the day at the school, so I I told the, you know, the attendance lady, hey, you know, it's not some you know wily teenagers ringing. It's gonna be me. And then I went out and rang it. I had never done that before. And I mean, it's beautiful when you're, when you're right underneath that bell. It's, it's amazing. I mean, there's a whole other story after about everybody who banded together to make to get that bell refurbished and and actually hung and people people working together to ma- actually make that happen was a whole other thing. That's kind of what I wanted to ask you about. One of the words that keeps coming up is community. And um it feels like you had an embrace in a way that maybe I certainly didn't see coming. I wonder how it felt to you. Yeah, I also didn't see it coming. I I was sort of expecting to be um ostracized to be honest <laughs> and and I don't know where that idea came from um you know I think I well I know I had you know preconceived ideas of what kind of teenagers killed themselves <laughs> um if I'm honest mm. and you know I'm sorry to be blunt but <laughs> um You've been blunt with us this whole time. Yeah, I appreciate yeah, it. You really you. have been. I think that's the that's the guiding light of this story. You've told us your own truth. So do, please don't stop now. I thank you. I think we every everybody in Snap Nation thanks you for just telling the truth. Um, I wept with you, and um, we've never met before, and I laugh with you too when I think about this brilliant beautiful boy I've got a brilliant beautiful boy a ridiculous boy Mm -hmm. and I was actually with him when I was listening to some of your story and it made me squeeze on him really 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 tight and I felt love from your story i felt like i it it gave me um power to just squeeze that this big old huge kid i have and hug on him without there wasn't the darkness of that i and it was a gift that you gave i want to run away from the darkness and you've let me kind of look back into it a little Mm -hmm. bit and and look at it for what it is did you do that before this yes was that part of you before yes um, that was sort of my, my way of enduring before and, and the way that I taught the boys, you know, Lyle said, you always told us to pay attention to everything, but now what all, what that means is that everything that I paid attention to reminds me of Finn. I, I can't turn away from everything that reminds me of Finn because there would, I would just, I mean, you know a black hole would still remind me of Finn. <laughs> I, I also think that part of the reason it, it turned out the way it did for me is that I, you know, when your kid kills himself, I, I, I cannot, guilt is um, for every, you know, motherly miscalculation whether big or small is is pretty much unbearable. <laughs> I mean it continues to plague me. Um but in order in order to to keep going y- y- you have to start forgiving yourself. And what that what that did for me is also made it easier for me to forgive everybody else 
Does that mean forgiving Finn? You know, I haven't, I haven't gotten to the point where I'm angry with him. And, and that's a true statement. You know, I think most of us have been in a very dark seconds and Finn had a gun. Right. And that wasn't his fault. That was a real, a real, you know, I mean, I always bought organic strawberries, but he had a hunting rifle. Mm. You know, you, you think something that makes absolutely no sense to me now. I, I can't even say it. It sounds it sounds so ridiculous, but that's just how it was. He never even hunted. He would walk in the woods with a hunting gun because that's what the boys around here did. You mention despair and how so many people are going to benefit from hearing you speak so openly about your experience. It's such a gift. Thank you. And it's such a gift. Um, no one, I guess one of the things, no one ever wants to talk about, talk the truth about certain situations and you actually are and it's so rare and so honest and so yeah. true and you also talk about the truth about despair and i'm wondering like what's where, where's your power coming from where, where is this light coming from right now from you i mean i have amazing friends i have lyle who is still you know um getting out of bed every morning and throwing a baseball and you know Lyle is a big part of it um solitude um you know I spend a lot of time trying to figure things out <laughs> um you know and and I can choose to explore what this is like and that's what I'm doing and I can choose to tell people because I couldn't find, I mean, I, you know, Googled the shit, excuse my language, out of like <laughs> parents wanting to talk openly about what this was like. And there's not a lot, there's not a lot out there. Um, Cause I looked, mm. there's support groups and stuff, you know, but I just, I don't, um, that doesn't work for me. And, and I'm not disparaging it. If it works for somebody else, like go get them. Um, but but for me, this this feels like it's my job, and and it's my duty to Finn. Um, you know, I I think, you know, he this this was a spontaneous, this really bad decision. Um, that we are all left with living for the rest of our lives. And uh, that's not going to stop. You know, it's, it's a hard, it's a hard reckoning. I, I, I know that death is, that, that, that is a universal thing that happens. And um, suicide is different. Um, well, Tara, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you'd like to talk about? No, I mean, um, yeah, I know I'm not the best interviewer. I sort of. Uh, <laughs> You're the fa most amazing interviewee of all time. Thanks. There I you can't, go. Tara, I am, I am blown away. I am honored. I am grateful. Erica made a wonderful story. I'm in audio and I hear a lot of stories. Sure. And um, I love this story so much. And I really, really thank you for your openness and, and allowing it to be made. Thank you. And, and you know, endless thanks to Erica and, and for you um, to be giving this for her as well. You know, I mean. It, well, I can't wait for everyone to hear it and love to your entire family. 
Seriously. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Take care of you and, and yours as well. I'm taking care of them a lot better thanks to you. A lot more um, consciously. Excellent. That's that's all I can hope for um, for everybody. And, and I appreciate you telling me that. Thank you. It's true. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Take care. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Erica. To learn more about Finn and the Bell, visit rumblestripvermont.com. Think about where you've just been, what you've just heard, what you've felt, and know that hours of amazing journeys on the Snap Judgment Podcast are available right now wherever you get your podcasts. And please know that this is not the news. No way is this the news. In fact, you can tell everyone that you care about how much you love them. You can tell them right now, right this minute, even the ones you're angry with, especially the ones you're angry with. You could do that. And you would still not be as far away from the news as this is. But this is 